all today. Um, it's pretty cool to be speaking at UCI. This is my alma mater. So I was once a student and now I'm a teacher here. So I'm my way back in. Um, okay. So today we will be talking about death of the media query. Uh, from the title, I'm promising you much more than I can deliver, but we'll learn a bit about Flexbox and CSS Grid, and um, I've also uh, bait, bait and switched you with uh, Calc. It's in there, the slides are in there, but I think I'm going to skip a fair chunk of it. <laughs> but I have been told the last presentation I had frogs and I have cats, so come on. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is me, I already got an introduction, company, company, cool. Slides are online at, I had to do it at my name, so it's like harder to spell for you, but uh, they're there. They're also referenced at the end, if that is handy for you. Um, okay, so what is a media query? A media query is this thing that allows us in design to be able to create different styles at different breakpoints in a device. So we see here a desktop version, and then eventually it will snap into whether it's a tablet version or mobile or whatever else, and the designs all change. And in order to achieve this, you're writing separate styles for each version of the website, which can be tedious to update, and historically we would, we would do this with various measurements, like maybe percentages or these types of things, which can be a bit of a headache because 10% of spacing might look great on a desktop, but when you get down to a mobile device to have 10% spacing on either side of your elements can be really clunky or it's just an odd way to distribute space. Um, traditionally, or I think of like a very early time of thinking about media queries, we would think about it as desktop, tablet, mobile device, but as we all know, this isn't really relevant anymore because a mobile device can be quite small to a little bit bigger. If you flip it into landscape, you're dealing with like 600 pixels, which is this like odd middle ground where you're not at a tablet yet. And you get to a tablet, and between a tablet and a desktop, yada, yada, yada. Um, there's no real like proper breakpoint anymore. It's just this should look nice no matter where I'm moving my browser. Okay, so there will be no death of the media query today, unfortunately. <laughs> but the concept here is that we're going to look at how to use Flexbox and how to use CSS Grid. And the slides are there for Calc tucked away if you want to look at it. Um, in an effort to create flexible design that will not require us to think so hard about our breakpoints because uh, the way space is being distributed or the way that we handle layout is much more elegant without us needing to be surgical and go in and think about each breakpoint per device. Okay, so um, I used to do a lot of primer with this talk on like, oh, it's so hard to like learn new styling, which like fair enough it is, and if you're comfortable with Flexbox, you can get a ton done with it. If you are really curious about CSS Grid and both these things are kind of foreign to you, um, you can go down either route and you'll be able to achieve quite a bit. Um, and then this image always reminds me of like maybe you're getting, like if you're working on a project and it's something that you've inherited and there's 2,000 lines of styling already existing on it and you're doing like a hundred dollar like patch on it, it's not the time to go in and like rethink the framework and drop in flex blocks. And in my mind, these are like your clients calling you like Friday evening about to go to dinner and like, we got this great idea. Um, so it's all like in pacing and thinking about how to learn bits of it incorporated into your work. It does save a tremendous amount of time if you are templating, if you are very comfortable with these things, flex blocks and CSS Okay. Um, Compatibility, the spiel is like much briefer as like each day that goes by. If you go to caniuse.com, if you're not familiar with that, you can put in a CSS um, property and see how compatible it is with browsers and browser versions. Um, CSS Grid and Flexbox are green across the board with modern browsers with like a greenish tint in the Internet Explorer realm. Um, Morton Hendrickson, who's a big name in WordPress and also very smart and awesome. Um, he has put forth this concept in one of his talks about no longer thinking about uh, responsive design in terms of like devices, but thinking along the lines of uh, by browser. 
which I thought was like a really nice way to like put Internet Explorer in the corner. <laughs> Maybe it was like an ugly spin on um, what he was trying to say, but essentially like if you're, if the mobile version of the site is all that works on a particular browser, then maybe that's what it gets. Like, or, I don't know. Take it for what you will. It's, all this stuff is like very compatible at this point. Um, and then the last bit of primer, if you are completely unfamiliar with CSS and you want to follow along conceptually, CSS happens to be syntactically a very easy language and consistent language to follow. Um, so here is a simple CSS rule. You pick something that you want to change the style of, in this case an H1 header. You say what you want to do with it, in this case color. And then you give it a value, red, and you change it. Cool. OK. Tree of serenity. Your brain is clear. <laughs> I'm going to show you some code. It's not so bad at all, uh, but there is code. And hopefully it's legible. Let me get a kitty before we go there. So we're going to hop into Flexbox. And when we're thinking about Flexbox, we're thinking about spacing. And uh, conceptualize this in your head as historically we've done this with like percentages and thinking about spacing like padding like inside of an element or margins outside of an element. Right now, you are thinking about an element being whatever it needs to be, whether it's a word or an image. And then all that space that makes it difficult to design across different devices is something that Flexbox is putting all of its energy into handling for you. It's taking all that extra space and distributing it in different fashions that will make it look nice across devices. Okay. So in a basic tutorial of Flexbox, um, here is some markup for a navigation. And in order to enable Flexbox, you are thinking about a parent-child relationship in your HTML. So in this case, we have a nav wrapper around some link tags. We are going to say that that nav wrapper should display Flex. And now we have opened up all the magic of Flexbox to our disposal. Um, we are going to use the property justify content. We're going to give it a value of center. And right now, we're thinking about spacing on the horizontal axis. And we are allowing Flexbox to control that spacing for us. So visually, when we look at this, we see that we have three elements. They are within a Flex container. They are all children of that Flex container. And they've been told to justify center on the horizontal axis. Um, I'm not thinking about the space on the left or the right. I'm just saying put it in the center and it will put it in the center regardless of the width of the device. If you take justify content and you use the value of space between, you get a layout that is pretty common with the navigation of spread things out, left, center, right. In this case, because we have three items, but if you have four, it would distribute them in quarters-ish. Um, space around is a one-off of space between, and what you're getting is an equal amount of spacing left and right on each element. Cool. The beauty of this is that you aren't doing it for a particular width. You aren't thinking about how wide this device is. All of this is responsive across devices, as we see. OK. So Justify Content takes in these values. This is easy to look up. CSS Tricks has a great article that goes through every property and value of Flexbox. And it's really thoughtfully laid out. And if you were just learning it, and the only real hindrance you have is just remembering the names, that article puts it all together in like a really nice way to see it. Um, when you're thinking about vertical spacing, you can use the align items property. And it has similar values that allow you to control spacing on the vertical axis. Now, <coughs> there are situations where these properties sort of do the inverse, which I'm not going to touch on for sake of this. But you always have the ability to control horizontal and vertical spacing. OK, so here's a little chart from CSS Tricks on what Align Items is doing. Similar concept, top, bottom, center, stretch, which is pretty handy, cover all the space equally. And then baseline, uh, I guarantee that if you're going from PSDs to creating something, a template, that you're going to find a PSD that has different font sizes that are supposed to be lined up perfectly. And you won't think about it in any sort of discussion or thinking about scope or time. And also, you have to get those texts lined up with each other. Flexbox is the way to do it. Any other way to do it will drive you mad. <laughs> OK. So here is where I find myself using Flexbox a lot. When you are creating a template, and a lot of times when you're working with a content management system like WordPress, you're going to end up with these cards. And I'm envisioning a content type coming out, and I need to template it into this card consistently. 
Um, so this particular content type, let's say it's a news article, it has a featured image, it has the title in red, has a little body text, has some sort of button called to action, and then another link on the bottom. Now, our first conception of Flexbox is just we can make a navigation, great. But there's no reason why we can't nest flex containers or use flex containers in more elaborate ways to control spacing uh, with content like this that's coming from the database in different formats to create layouts that are going to look really nice across devices. So what I do here is first I think about this and I grab it in a, uh, in a container everything. And then within that container, I want to create to internal containers, and at this point, I can use Flexbox to control spacing for me. And I can say, put one thing at the top, put one thing at the bottom. I also want both of these things to be centered. They're near the edge, but I want them to be middle in the middle of the card. Then I nest Flexbox, and I will grab an additional element at the bottom of the page, and I say, split these two elements apart. Um, so Flexbox can be really, really handy with layout. Uh, one other common problem that it solves is you're usually not dealing with one of these cards alone. You would have a set of them. A lot of times you get these like three columns across. Um, and you end up in these situations where you have a little bit more text than you would on other cards. Uh, Flexbox align item center, or stretch, excuse me, will create equal height for all of these elements. And it does that, that's the default property for align items. So it um, consistently uh, helps with layouts. Now, I hope that uh, you can see this, but we start off with something small like a navigation. We think about like a piece, like a card, but what you can do when templating with Flexbox is really elaborate, and remember that all this is holding across different devices. At some point, you're going to have things clunk up next to each other, and Flexbox actually has like uh, a really easy means of like controlling your access. Originally, you're thinking about things on horizontal. You can stack things vertically, depending on what you need per device. But in terms of trying to deal with that headache from like 650 pixels up to a huge screen, this will be consistent for you. So when we're looking at a template like this, we can think about our logo and our tagline as one flex container. We can move items to the bottom of that box. We can separate them out from each other. When we jump into our navigation, we can think of two separate items that we want to spread on opposite sides of that particular row of content. We can go into each of these elements, and we can create space around on the left side, and we can center the item on the right side. For this image, I want to basically put that text in the bottom corner. I want a little bit of space on the left, which I could address with margin. Um, the way that we use margin in Flexbox is a variant from CSS Grid, which has a different way of dealing with spacing, which we'll see, which is one of not a tremendous amount of nuances between the two of them. Um, we'll get there. Cool. Tree of Serenity. <laughs> Brief moment. I know everything about Flexbox. I know I know everything about Flexbox. Whatever. We're going deeper. OK, grid, two times the kitty. <laughs> Little did you know that the cat on the first slide and the cat on the flex box slide were actually siblings. Just kidding, sorry. <laughs> 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 OK, CSS grid. Um, CSS grid is super exciting. It allows you to make art online. You can do anything. Uh, what's really cool about CSS grid is that um, the way that you can control a layout, the, an early conception of CSS Grid versus Flexbox is Flexbox really helps with your rows of content. And that can be a little bit of like a, my, a mental jump when you're still thinking about moving things on the vertical axis, but you're dealing with like a row of content that you're moving on that vertical axis. Flexbox actually has uh, a great deal of uh, ability to do things that span multiple rows. When you want variance within those rows, you can achieve it, but there are some headaches there. CSS Grid is great when you're thinking about, about a broader layout of several pieces that need to be spread out in a particular manner. Or if you want to create empty spacing, CSS Grid can handle that in a way that would either not be possible or quite difficult with Flexbox. So I show the art because it's exciting. All of these are from uh, Jen Simmons Labs. She has like some really cool use cases for CSS Grid on the like, aesthetic end of things. 
But just like with Flexbox, we're going through the same formula where we're taking a parent container from your HTML markup. It's going to have children. In order to enable the powers of CSS grid, we're going to take our parent container, in this case a section tag, and we're going to say display grid. And now we have all the magic of CSS grid at our disposal. Cool. So we're going to look at some basic grid examples. Um, I'm changing up our markup a little bit to just be a wrapper with some children that have the alphabet A through F within them. And I am introducing a new property here of grid template columns. When we're thinking about grid, we, a simple way to conceptualize this is to think about a table. We're creating cells, columns, and rows. So right here, I'm saying give me three columns. Each column should be 100 pixels wide. Cool. So. Um, our first three elements pop into the top row, each one is 100 pixels wide, and then our next three elements implicitly create the next row of the grid, and we get an additional three cells. Cool. What about this is magical? Okay. After this, we are also getting the FR unit within CSS grid. And the FR unit is effectively replacing the need for uh, percentages and what it's doing is it stands for a fraction unit, and it takes up whatever space is left over. Um, if it's replacing percentages, what exactly are we gaining? I don't know, but let's take a look at it. So we are doing the same thing, three columns, one FR, one FR, one FR, instead of 100 pixels. And in this case, our DOM comes in, three columns, they're spread out, they're all even, great. The difference here is that we're getting something that is flexible across devices, but how is this different than a percentage? Still nothing quite there. Um, however, something that's kind of cool is that you can combine a static value with one of R. And you could probably cheat your way into something like this using calc and some subtraction, but it's so much cleaner, cleaner to say, give me a static column that's 250 pixels in this example, and then with the rest of the space, regardless of how big this device is, create a column that is that wide. So we end up with something like this. We have six elements. They come in to our new two-column grid, and they go 250 pixels wide, and then one FR with the rest of the space. This will, yet again, work flexibly, will be responsive across devices. So a situation where this might be handy is if maybe you're doing a blog layout, or uh, WebBoz has a tutorial that's referenced at the end of this where he has like an album cover with like description. And there are these times where you have an element that looks really great at a particular width that would look quite funny if you let it get too small or quite funny if it gets too large. Uh, most common would probably be something like an image. And you have elements that work really well across devices stretching and shrinking like text to be able to have a static value with a fluid value next to it without thinking about this is on a mobile device, this is on a desktop. It's really handy. Okay, if we wanted to take this one step further, we would introduce min-max. So min-max is a new keyword within, a new function rather, within CSS Grid, which allows us to provide, you guessed it, a minimum value and a maximum value. So, if we were to do something similar to what we were just doing, where we knew that something looked good at a static value, but it actually would be nice if it could grow with the screen as it gets larger, it just would lose context after a certain point of getting too small. We could say grid template columns, give us two columns, even though we're providing three values. But we're saying for one value, here's a minimum and maximum range of don't get any smaller than 250 pixels. It's gonna look silly if this image gets any smaller. Then if there is more space, we'll have a column that can grow one of our next to another column of one of our. So what does that mean? We have a minimum of 250 pixels, so our image in this will not get any smaller than 250 pixels. So it bottoms out at some point, it reaches its minimum. But as the device gets bigger, it starts to grow with the text. Cool. Okay, so somewhere where this is uh, easy to grasp some of the fluidity across columns and rows is with image galleries. So in Jen Simmons Labs, you'll find this example where you have um, a seven column layout here of images. 
Now, if you were to create a seven column layout, it's tricky to be able to create a seven column layout that can stay seven columns but can grow and shrink as the device moves. But beyond that, it would be rather difficult to create the same layout that could go down to six columns on a smaller device, it could go down to four columns on a smaller device, uh, all with one CSS rule. So how do we do it? Okay, to get closer to it, we have to learn about the repeat function. So this isn't a huge conceptual, conceptual leap from where we were moments ago. Um, repeat works, uh, as we see here, you provide it two values. One is the number of times that you want your column to repeat. So I'm saying I want three columns. The second number that you provide is the value that you want repeated. So I am saying in both rules, give me one FR, one FR, one FR. At this point, I'm still only creating grids that have columns, and I'm just having my rows come in. Okay. However, when the Jen Simmons example that we were just looking at, we have the ability to change the number of columns. We're not getting much further with repeat because we're still providing a fixed value of three to say how many columns we want in this layout. We can use the autofill keyword to automatically populate the number of columns that the device can fit. And we are saying put as many 100 pixel columns as will fit here, we're saying repeat autofill, do as many columns as I want, make them all 100 pixels. See it visualized, we end up with something like this, where our DOM has letters A through L. Each of those elements is 100 pixels wide. Dependent on the device width, our columns will grow and shrink within that range. The problem here, is we want optimum fluidity, and we saw in Jen Simmons' example that there were seven columns in the original shot, in those seven columns, those images could grow for a larger device size. In order to have our columns grow and shrink, right now our number of columns is changing, but the columns themselves are staying that static value of 100 pixels. In order to achieve that fluidity where they grow and shrink with the device, we have to reintroduce min-max into this formula. And I know that this gets kind of chunky for CSS, but that's the first time you're looking at it, or maybe it's not the first time you're looking at it. It's not, it's not so bad. Um, so we're saying grid template columns. We're only thinking about columns still. We're using repeat because we want to be able to do this in terms that uh, aren't static. We want to be able to create multiple columns. For our repeat value, the number of columns, we're using the autofill keyword, which will just magically take our DOM, our HTML, and say grow within this area or shrink within this area. And then we're saying min max to say, this is the value of the column. Don't make it any smaller than 150 pixels, so still giving you a static value. But it can grow up to one FR. Meaning that we look at essentially the same thing that we were just looking at, except that our columns before they jump up to the next row, we'll watch it again. Before B can go to A, there has to be a minimum of 150 pixel space on the row above for it to jump up there. So they go 150 pixels each, and then they grow, 150 pixels each, and then they grow. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, going a little bit further down the route of uh, Images, but this doesn't have to be images. This can be content cards, or this can be any interesting layout that your designer is handing over to you. Um, flow in CSS Grid, as we've seen it so far, it's taking your HTML. We've seen our alphabet A, B, C, D, A, B, A, B, B. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's taking the alphabet and feeding it into the DOM, top to bottom, left to right. And this is how HTML always works, um, it wants to go in this order. However, if you have cells that are larger and you want to make a layout that's a little bit more complex and your DOM doesn't happen to be uh, fitting just perfectly, so in this example we see A is big and then we have B, C, D, and then ideally E would be the same size as B, C, D, However, it's too wide and it comes down a line and then we're left with this empty gap. So this is the default flow of CSS grid. However, 
there is a property in CSS Grid where you can say grid autoflow dense. And what this will do is it will go through the DOM the way that it wants to, and go A, B, C, D, jump down a line E, just like it did the first time. But the next time it comes to an element that fits an empty space that it passes, it will go back and fill it in. It's pretty amazing. And you end up with something that, yet again, is incredibly fluid across devices that will grow and shrink. Now, this could create an amazing layout, and there's no like real hindrance to creating it, and you don't have to think about it too hard from mobile to desktop, which is what we want to achieve. Um, however, in order to do this, you have to think very hard in advance, like, what can I crop to be these various pieces to fit this grid? Uh, yet again, uh, Wes Baugh's tutorial reference at the end has a pretty cool gallery that he makes of this, and he also provides some JS where you can, like, uh, click an image gallery, but if you click on it, and you get the modal pop-up, but it looks super clean. It's very cool. Okay. Last tree of serenity. <laughs> okay. So when we're thinking about this up to this point, um, we're just sort of we're discussing uh, the ability to mess with columns in CSS Grid. We've thought about how Flexbox is really great with spacing. We thought about how CSS Grid helps us do like broader layouts. We had some fun with the columns, but at the same time, you can create empty cells and do a lot of magic with CSS Grid that's a little bit trickier and blah, blah, um, Something kind of amazing that CSS Grid can do uh, gets enabled when you start using grid areas. Now, uh, early conception of where we're going, and I know that this is like painfully small, um, but the idea here is that in our left-hand column, we're looking at a desktop device. And it's not in terms of width, just in terms of layout. And we have our element. So we have some sort of a logo at the top. We have a navigation. We have body. And then we have a sidebar, maybe. I think this is advertising. And then footer. It's like a reading text. Um, then we have our tablet layout, where our pieces kind of come together. And then we have our mobile layout. Lab. Actually, I did that completely backwards. Mobile is on the left. But the point is that like our layout is changing across these devices. Now, just like we learned, not unique to CSS Grid, but just the way that HTML comes onto a page, it goes top to bottom, right? Whatever is first in your HTML, your header, and then some body paragraph, and then an image, it's going to go straight onto the page that way. And you can style it with CSS, but in terms of moving it around and rearranging the order, you have some ability in Flexbox to do this. You have the ability to like order within both of these uh, display types. But to truly move your markup around is something that you just wouldn't do. You would write two versions of the markup, and you'd have some sort of script to say, load this, or you would hide things and then show them. Um, I imagine everyone here has probably done that at some point, where they have like a huge image, and they have to swap it out with one. Um, OK, so with grid template areas, we are able to control, control the flow of our DOM even further than just saying dense and kind of counting on it filling in pieces. We can hand place pieces into our DOM elements into our grid, which is pretty cool. OK, same concept here. We have a container, a wrapper. We have some children. Our children, in this case, are named header, hero, content, sidebar. And these are going to be our grid cells within our grid container. This is the first time that we're not just creating a column, but we're explicitly saying these are our rows. Um, so we're going to have a single column that's going to be the full width, 1FR. And then we are explicitly declaring five rows. And we're going to, since they're a fraction, they add up to a whole. So you have 1FR. Then 2 FR will be twice as big, 3 FR will be three times as big as the first, and then 1 FR, 1 FR. Cool. Going back to our layout, <coughs> you see that we have one column, we have our row heights explicitly defined, and we have five cells in this grid. Cool. Our DOM is going to want to naturally flow in header, hero, content, sidebar, footer. Cool. Um, what we want to do is assume that this is a mobile device. And we want to assume that on our desktop, we want to move some of these pieces around, just like we saw in that first slide of varied layouts. 
So with grid template areas, you have the ability to name the cell regions within your grid. So in this case, we have five cells. And just for sake of example, they're all at this point called grid cell, grid cell, grid cell, grid cell, um, grid cell. You can stack them on top of each other, on top of each other. You get this visual representation of what your layout ends up looking like. Okay. Now to actually take advantage of this naming convention, we want to use names that make some sense, and we make up those names. So we say that we want our header to be first, our hero to be second, our content, our sidebar, our footer. Cool. At this point, we're just mimicking what the HTML markup is doing naturally. However, or okay, this is more explicitly saying where these pieces are going. We're telling in our CSS saying where in the layout they should go. We've named each of these cells something. We're saying in our CSS, take the element that has a class of header, put it in the grid area that I have named header. However, if we wanted to, we could say take the hero and put it in the grid area of footer in our CSS, and it would put it in the grid area of footer, and we could say take our footer and put it in the hero. Pretty nuts. Um, so bringing media queries back into the mix here. Um, if we were to take that same layout, five cells stacked on top of each other, and we were to say, now for a larger device, I want to create this layout that has two columns and four rows. So we'd end up with something like this. We now have eight cells. We use grid template areas to come in. Our naturally, our HTML markup will fall into the first five cells. There are still those three additional cells, because I have an explicit grid created that has eight cells, two columns, four rows. What we can do from here is we can name our grid cells with grid template areas. And I have to account for eight different cells on four rows. I'm going to give them the name. And what you can do is you can have a template area span across two cells. You can have it span across two rows if you want. So I can say header, header, and hero, hero. Content, sidebar. You can put it cells next to each other. Footer, footer. Now, I have five DOM elements that are going to fill into these areas once I assign them those grid template area names. So I say that I want my header to go into header, which means that it will span the entirety of the header. I want my hero to go into hero. It will span the second row. Content, left side of the third, the third row, sidebar, et cetera. See this visually. It's all mapped out in our CSS. Uh, um, so Flexbox versus CSS grid. This is a common question. I added this slide like 10 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> so uh, WebBoss does have a video in his free course that's like Flexbox versus CSS grid, and he goes into 20 different examples. And I think they're like a little bit hard to follow. But the, the biggest takeaway is like an early conception of this is, yet again, Flexbox handles your rows and CSS Grid handles like a broader layout. I do think for broader layout challenges, it's nice to use CSS Grid to conceptualize like where pieces should go or to deal with something complicated like empty spacing, or if you want things to flow in a varied pattern across rows, uh, which I'll touch on in a sec again, um, that CSS Grid has some advantages in that realm. Uh, Flexbox can do a lot of what CSS Grid is doing. And as we saw in that brief mock-up of uh, that website, the Choices website, if you go row by row with content, which most like templates require, unless you have like a really elaborate uh, chunk of content to create from PSD to a template file, you can get away with using Flexbox for a lot of things. And it goes really smoothly. So if you're comfortable with that, use it. Um, one variation between the two of them is that Grid has this thing called grid gap, which creates spaces between cells. While Flexbox has no thing, uh, no such thing as Flexbox gap or Flex gap. Um, so you have to bring in margin to create spacing around your elements. And when you're dealing with these things that handle spacing for you in a really elegant way, to bring in your own exceptions of spacing uh, with margin in a fashion that's not incorporated into the, the syntax or that particular rule 
can get a little bit mucky as you go down the road. While CSS Grid has gaps built into it, and it's just part of like the broader conception of this grid. Um, going back one more time to dealing with like things that scan rows in Flexbox, if you were to say space around, or spa yeah, space around, and you had that flow across multiple rows, this is the one where you have a little bit of space on the left, a little bit of space on the right, and then spacing in between. As you come to the next row, if you have four elements and you have three columns, you're going to have space around, space around, space around. It's going to look nice on that first row. And then you're going to have the additional piece come down, and it's going to end up centered. And I find this really annoying with Flexbox. Um, you can target that element individually and push it over to the left so that it looks like it's like in the broader spacing of the thing. But you don't really know at what point it's going to go down to the next line. Um, CSS Grid, on the other hand, you have cells mapped out, and you can create that flow across rows in an easier way. That's one headache that I find myself running into with Flexbox that Grid solves. Okay, no more code. Calc is at the end of this, if it's of any interest to you. Um, moving forward, if you are scared about compatibility, look into app support. It's kind of like a media query, but you put code that you're like scared will this run in the browser inside of that rule, and it won't run if the browser does not support it. Uh, food for thought. Uh, so Foundation, which is a comparable to Bootstrap, has rebuilt its column structure using Blackbox, which is really cool. Um, but historically, in my personal experience, I've used frameworks like Bootstrap and Foundation for the columns within them. I don't really use columns anymore. Like I, I find Flexbox or CSS Grid easier to do layouts with. Um, so maybe you don't need it. And if you want to keep learning, Flexbox Froggy, CSS Garden are really easy ways to just like touch it for the first time. Um, if you want something more robust, West Boss has a course on Flexbox and a course on CSS Grid. If you're excited about the World Cup, which Yes. They just be mean in America. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, Go Germany. <laughs> there is a CSS grid tutorial to lay out soccer player formation. I want to strike Go Germany from the record. <laughs> um, really, someone really smart talking about the same things. Morton Hendrickson has a talk on WordPress TV. Jen Simmons has really cool visual examples of a lot of the stuff. And then Rachel Andrews has a blog. She has common examples. She has a YouTube video tutorial. She has an ebook. And all of her stuff on CS Grid is amazing. Cool. Where are your slides? Uh, my slides are at saeedabasi.com forward slash WC for camp. Okay, great. great, thank you. How long was that transition? How long did it take you to go from using things like bootstraps and columns to Flexbox and Grid? So, when, when I was using Bootstrap, it was, like I was saying, strictly for columns. So I wasn't as tied into like getting button styles really quick or something like that. So it would have been a harder transition out if I was like deeper into it. Um, in terms of when it like really came, like why would I make a template myself and incorporate columns? Unless it's like very specifically done on like a 15 column grid and it's just annoying to like think about like what that equates to. Um, it came after the first time I made this presentation. <laughs> it was like, oh, I like really understand this stuff now. I should use it. <laughs> So it sounds like you choose one or the other to make a layout with? I think my original like answer to this was like, think about a broader layout in CSS Grid. And this is like the common answer. Like, people say like, think of I think, like, 3D is how they say it, which doesn't make sense on the screen. But like, think about like multiple rows in CSS Grid, and then think about Flexbox across one row. I think in terms of application, that's probably accurate. I what you can do in Flexbox and what you can do in CSS Grid for most problems, both can't handle. So it's really only those edge cases, which WebBoss like defines rather well. In that particular case. Yes. Uh, 
Yes. So I've used Flexbox CSS Grid. This is the first time, honestly, I, I've seen it or aware of it. And you sort of showed some examples that showed functions. Is this all native to CSS supported now, or does CSS Grid go through a pre parser or something else, or is it just? Sure. So, so the question is, uh, this is the first time that he's looked at CSS Grid, and we introduced all these functions like min, max, and repeat, etc. cetera. Um, does this have to go through a preprocessor like SAS uh, would, or is this native to CSS? And this is all native to CSS. It just works in plain CSS. All right, we're out of time. Thank you.